Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll call this meeting to order. The water, uh, what, today is the uh, Tuesday the 23rd? Oh, no, it isn't. 23rd of February. I'm looking at the wrong piece of paper. <laughs> uh, Tuesday the 25th of May. Um, and um, I have to open the meeting then and adjourn the meeting because at this stage we don't have a quorum. Um, uh, we have an apology from Councillor Rush from um, Wellington. Uh, and we haven't heard from Councillor Hayward, so I'm hoping he is on his way. So we need to adjourn until he does arrive. I'm, my apologies about this. Um, in fact, I might go and ring him. Okay, we can uh, recommence. Uh, so we have uh, also sitting in the background officers from various uh, Anna Hector, uh, Ian McSherry, uh, Paul Gardner and Colin Gerrard, who's the general manager of Viola. Um, we have an apology from Councillor Rush, so I'll move that apology. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Duncan, second that. All those in favour, aye. Uh, public forum, uh, we have a request from Michelle Wasowski. Wachowski and uh, Marie Wright. So welcome if you'd like to come forth and um, you have 10 minutes. It's very touch. I'll just bring it up. Okay. okay. And this this moves it back and forth, does it? Oh yeah. Cool. Thank you, Jack, for all your work again. <laughs> um Kia ora everyone, um, nice to see you all again. Um, we just, Murray and I just wanted to come and let you know what we've been up to. And um, so thanks, thanks for having us. All right, um, that's the update. So uh, we had a very successful hui in March for the network, um, summed up nicely by Ngāti Toa CE Helmut Wodlik. Um, he called on people to commit to solutions and not dwell on past problems. He likened the stormwater running into the wastewater network to a flood in a laundry. Uh, he said, you've got two jobs. Uh, one is to turn the water off and the other is to start mopping. It seems a lot of this kōrero is about mopping, 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 and we need to turn the damn water off. So um, this comment refers to years of leakages, spills, overflows, reports, dye testing, CCTV scoping, fancy annual reports, promises and deferrals. So, uh, when it just needs to be fixed. So, um, this, this goes a long way. I mean, you guys all know this, but uh, the general public um, might find this quite interesting. Um, so, this is the stormwater consent, obviously, to help put all these things in place. It has been around for a little while. And um, met with Ian down the back. Thanks, Ian. And met with Ian and Abby. And um, we talked about a plan. And we also talked about a human... Human Health Mitigation Plan, which has been great. Um, Afero Bay has now got one. That's their one there. Uh, we're still waiting. Um, we did do an OIA for that, and Abby's assured us that it's coming. Um, so that would be really great to have something um, in writing. 
Uh, here's Abby. She's been fantastic keeping in contact. And they've got a great newsletter now for Ferro Bay. And this is what we'd like to see for Titahi Bay as well. It's a really great um, newsletter. They have monthly meetings. We're going to pop along to that. It's the uh, 3rd of June next week. <laughs> Um, after the 2nd of June, which is the storage tank meeting. So lots of great things happening. Um, sorry, I just wanted to go back. Oh, no, there's nothing there. Um, this is the um, site that we get most of our data off. We do have a Titahi Bay water quality site, which was disestablished last year, uh, re-established, and it might be disestablished again. <laughs> So they're um, just trying to figure out the right way to put data up. At the moment, this is, this is what we've got for um, testing our streams. Um, the Titahi Bay water quality site is more about testing the, um, the, the consent for the treatment plant. Um, it's, it's a bit confusing, so that's why that we're thinking about changing that. I was talking to Abby about it today. And we're going to meet and have a talk about that. So this is what we go by. As you can see, it's a bit generic. Um, it shows huge spikes at the south end and it's difficult to tell if the intercoasty levels are in the hundreds or the thousands. And you might say, oh, that wouldn't be in the thousands, but that's what happened last year. Oh, that's what happened last year. That was way up. So um, pretty, pretty concerning in the thousands. So, and that was one of the readings we had, which is pretty horrific, actually. It was, it was very, very horrific, so horrific that we actually asked Mike um, what was going on and um, he said they're not being tested at the same time, and, and we know this, or as regularly as the beach, and uh, it's pretty much a given that the water coming from these outlets are contaminated. So that, that's what the, the hui was in March, was to try and get the public engaged and to, um, and to get them thinking about what they're doing in their own homes, but also about the public saying to the council and Wellington Water and everybody else that... We really need to get some some investment in. Um, so so this is the the recommended levels for for fresh water and for um, marine water. So uh, as you can see, it's a lot lower than uh, what we've been getting in Titahi Bay. So Mari's now just going to give you a quick report of what she's doing. And the reason I am able to write this report is I spend many hours weeding and watering the gardens at the north end of Titahi Bay Beach, around the surf club and Tom's Road, and I enjoy walking along our beautiful beach. Thank you for the continuing work on the network in the Titahi Bay recently. At the north end, with recent work on the Vela Street pump and manholes, behind the boat sheds and toilet block, that is cleaning and maintenance, and this has helped the stench from the pump station and sewage overflowing in the area. Is this sign by the toilets? Oh yeah, so um, we, we just noticed that the signs by the toilet, oh. When sorry. I was in the yeah. garden, I noticed that there was a sign by the toilets and the sign read, Oh, yes, uh, it drains into our harbour. Perhaps we could change that <laughs> to our bay, Titahi Bay. It's uh, um, using shampoo, shampoo conditioner, conditioner yeah. and the water drains. And it goes into our harbour. So it might be a generic sign that's being used, but it would be good to get a bit more specific. Now, Tom's Road, the leaking pipe by the surf club has been a health and safety issue particularly being slippery when walking down the ramp. For over three years, and despite numerous requests, including a new Toby, the water was turned off for five days for Anzac Day because of the health and safety issue, and when they turned it back on five days later, the water just poured out again like a tap. So I phoned Porora City Council and asked for the job number they said there's no number because the job has been completed. It was finally fixed a few weeks ago, thanks to Mike Duncan following up on all my requests. Yay. <laughs> and you can see here, um, where'd that little dot go? Oh, there. Oh, I can't make it work now. But over there where the green pipe's going out to the sea, that's the stormwater pipe and Tom's Road. You can see there's quite a lot of action going on with the manholes around the surf club. And so, the main... Oh, it was working. And the main um, 
sewerage pipe that runs yeah. all the way along the <coughs> beach yeah. front. Windley Ave Beach Access. The manhole in this area was dug up and pipes were replaced as there was a smelly leak going on to the beach. I don't know if this was a coincidence or not, but thanks again to Mike Duncan for following up my request. And at the south end, there has been, in the south end, this has been an area of concern for us. I read from a report from Nick Hewer Hewitt from Wellington Water. We spent about four months in Titahi Bay Southern Catchment investigating the likely acute contamination issues. We found one collapsed wastewater main and a number of cross connections, all of which we fixed. Unfortunately, the South Beach access culvert is still showing there is something going on in this area. This is an indicator of a chronic issue, which means a more detailed engineering investigation is required, one that will need to be properly resourced and funded. Poirua Council and Wellington Water work together to plan and fund the investigation. We have installed a specific warning sign at the culvert outlet warning people to avoid the water coming from the culvert. End of Nick's report. Thanks again to Mike for insisting on this sign due to my persistent requests. <laughs> and you can see from the slides there is an issues, there <coughs> are issues that plague this area, but not enough sampling is occurring despite requirements of the global consent. You can see on these maps why there is an issue. There is a buried pump station mm. and six manholes and work has not been done on the buried pump station since the 1980s when the electronics treatment plant was at MacArthur Park. The Titai Bay sewage pipe goes over to Rukutane Point, which was built in the 1960s and nearing its used-by date. When the treatment plant bypasses, which happens every time it rains heavily, untreated sewage from this pipe goes into the bay without going to the treatment plant first. You can see from the map. Yeah. And this and one, this this also one turns another map. Bay Drive as well. So there's a wastewater pipe going into the north end as well, as you can see there. So the septic tank plan, planned for Porua Harbour will have no effect on increased volume that's coming from Chitahi Bay. There appears to be no funding in the put aside in the long term plan for urgent work for these acute issues in the network at the south end. Thank you. Okay, so um, so this is a treatment plant staff and we've just had some problems going on with the UV, which I'm sure Anna will um, tell you all about. And um, basically, we, we were here at this meeting on the 6th of August in 2019 when um, they said that they were going to put a new UV in, in the next financial year. So um, basically because the UV keeps malfunctioning because it needs to, it's got one channel and a system and it just needs cleaning all the time. So um, they decided to put some money in and upgrade it. This is all part of the getting prepared for the consent. I don't want to stop you, but you have nearly had 11 oh, minutes or so. Oh, thank you. We're so. just about ready. Thank you. So, Sorry. Um, if you just a couple yep. more minutes and you can... have got two more slides left, three more okay. slides. Sorry. And then just see here, um, it's a bit behind budget. So, again, there's, uh, it's going to be deferred. And it continues to be deferred. And here's the report, which Anna's going to probably mention. It's in the agenda about it going offline. And we just wondered why, you know, with the power surge, it only affected the UV and not the rest of the plant. And then... Again here, the second time it happened in March and uh, the, to, 
the pump failed. But we think probably it was something to do with having to clean, and this happened in, in January 2019, and look at the fecal spikes there. Those were taken at the discharge outfall. So um, they're really, really quite significantly high. So we'd love something to be done with that UV. And that's pretty much it. Um, in the new, we're going to have a public hui. The consent's been notified today, which is great. And we did ask for, I think Wellington Water said, let's get together and have a, a drop-in centre. And we said, absolutely not, because the people don't know what they don't know. And if they have to ask questions to be informed, that's pretty unfair. So everybody came to the party. We had a great stormwater meeting. So we're going to do something very similar. And um, Abby and I are working how we do that with John also chairing that. So it's a really nice, positive meeting. And we look forward to that. Hope you guys can come along. And... Um, what else? That's it, really. We're just um, just working through now the uh, 800 plus documents and the Ages. conditions, <laughs> and um, and we'll be informing the the public as much as we can. We hope we hope they come. I mean, you know, you can't um, can't promise anything. Apathy is one of our biggest enemies. So, <laughs> but you know, that con that'll conclude our transparency and awareness for the reconsent process. So you'll probably miss us. I'm okay, sure. thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> just a couple of... Any questions? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, just a couple of questions, if there are any. Councillor Duncan, you've been kept on your toes, so... Um, <laughs> fine. Councillor Hayward, any question? No? All right. Okay, thank you, ladies. Um, we'll... Um, yeah, we're very much aware and uh, we appreciate you keeping us informed. Um, so, thank you yeah, for the no opportunity. Worries. Thank you. Thanks again, Jack, for all your work. Okay, so, uh, we'll carry on then. Conflicts of interest. There's no conflicts of interest. Uh, notification of extraordinary business. There's no notification. Confirmation of minutes for the meeting held on the 25th of February 2021. Um, so I'll move those. Did someone like to second those? Thank you, Councillor Hayward. Any matters arising from those? Being none, I'll move that those uh, be uh, minutes be taken. All those in favour? Aye, against. Carried. Okay, we now move to the reports, uh, the Wastewater Treatment Plant Joint Committee update, um, and Mr Dow. And Yeah, Mr Chair, I'll let um, um, Anna Hector, and Ian McSherry from Wellington Water take the table for their report. I'll move the report to get it on the table for that. Thank you, Councillor Duncan, for seconding it. Um, so through the chair, so um, further to the report, um, which I take as read, uh, there's a couple of updates regarding item number seven. Uh, obviously, and Marie's stolen my uh, thunder. The resource consent application was, was notified today. Um, so that application is accessible on Regional Council's webpage um, and the, it'll be done through the usual media channels. Um, in regards to item number 11, which is the UV upgrade project, which is currently underway, um, it is currently behind schedule. There were a couple of safety risks um, and third party work programs have led to this delay. Uh, the team is working on a, a recovery plan um, and our proposed new delivery date is November 2021. Um, the other thing is that based on some of the queries that came through last week, so, uh, last meeting, sorry, um, I've invited a couple of um, additional staff over. So we've got Paul Gardner from Wellington Water, who is the Principal Advisor, Resource Management Act, Consents and Environment, um, and he will answer any questions relating to the consents. Um, and Mr Gerard is the Wellington Regional Manager for Veolia, and he'll answer any questions relating to the operations of the treatment plant. Mr. Colin. Councillors, uh, any questions? Councillor Hayward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question in regards to the incident report that's uh, uh, published as an appendices to this uh, report. My read of it was that at the uh, time of the incident that there was not uh, written uh, procedures provided to their staff who are operating the plant. Can I get a correction on that? Because that's what it reads to me. 
I'll leave that with Mr Gerard to answer. Is that on? Yep. Um, so there were um, operational uh, instructions. So all our staff for doing operations fill in a uh, job safety environment assessment form and also a work method statement as well. Now, for this instance, that was not fully followed during the operation of the work, they said. So our operators didn't, um, didn't follow the procedures we expect from them um, and didn't meet the standards we expect as well. Sub, please. Uh, I might, you may have to give me a bit of a, uh, some latitude here because I've got a few questions that might be related to this point. Thank you, Mr Chair. So I'm not talking about what individual staffers have, may have done in terms of reporting their role. I'm trying to get a, get a sense of that there was actually a written down procedure for the for the incident that occurred uh, the, the two, that would have prevented or at least had shown their assurances. Can you just elaborate on that? Yeah, an operational manual. We, you, you got instructions, you got a manual? We do have an operation manual. It's in draft version at this point. Uh, when we took the plant over, there was none, which we have written. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Oh. So that was the question I want to know. At the time of the incident, there wasn't one. It was still in draft. So it was not finalised at that point. So can I just confirm that at the time between Veolia has been responsible for the plant's operations, at the time of the incident, when was the start of that procedure, that manual, uh, um, drafted? Immediately? We had started drafting before that procedure, before that incident happened. True, but can you give me some guidance as to when? Was this, was this, uh, would this not have been something that would have been, I would have thought, as part of transition, something that you would have immediately started. Can you give me that assurance? Um, I was not part of Viola at that time of transition. Um, I know we started it within the last 12 months, definitely. Do, one last question on yeah. this, one last up on this. Do you think that it is responsible from a health and safety perspective that an organisation responsible for operating a plant which has impacts on human health and safety, the wider community, to not have written down somewhere a precise guide that explicitly details the work that is required to be done as part of operations, and rather than leaving it to the institutional knowledge of any individuals who are at the plant and their ability to be human? Agreed, definitely. No, that's not really answering my question. Do you think that's responsible? Having an operation manual is best practice, and that's why we've brought it in place. Uh, we're in water, very keen on that part of the um, transition. Um, there is one being finalised. Um, obviously, we write it, we check it and review it through operating the plant to make sure it is complete and accurate. So that's why it's still in a draft form rather than finalised at this stage. <clears throat> I mean, they're starting from scratch because they were Viola took over the, the site without any instructions. Mr Chair, I'm, I'm well aware of that. What I'm trying to get a sense of is that as part of responsible plant operation, the contractor that is required to do this work, I would have thought from a health and safety perspective, would have had written instructions in place as a bulwark against the possibility of human error. Yeah, agreed. We definitely want these procedures in place. That's why we've been writing them and getting them in place. And it's in the process now to be finalised, basically looking at the next month or two is our plan. What assurances can you give the people of Porirua that other procedures regarding the other, any other element of the operations of the plant by, undercarried by Veolia have had the same level of stringency now being applied in terms of writing down these manuals and procedures. Can we trust you guys to do this? So the manuals cover the entire operation of the whole plant. That's the whole point of them, and that's part of the reason it takes so long, because it is not a quick exercise, but it covers the whole operation of all the plant. Um, in addition to that, we have staff that are trained um, so they're not walking off the street. They are trained operators overseen by further you know, um, supervisors who have experience as well. Councillor Duncan. Yeah, following on, on from that, um, 
Looking at the health and safety item number 16 on page 10, it seems to me you've actually cut a staff member. Um, yet um, we're talking about that incident being a result of operator fatigue. Am I right in assuming from that chart that you have actually cut one staff member? Yes. <laughs> Can you explain why? So back when the plant was operated by Wellington Water, it was the only wastewater treatment plant um, that we operated and maintained. So in order to cover for sick leave and annual leave um, and times when the, the plant wasn't, we needed more staff than was possibly necessary um, because well, Veolia run the four treatment plants. They have a lot more um, back up from the other treatment plants, and that was one of the reasons we went for a regional contract in the first place. Then um, the, op the operator fatigue isn't a factor? Uh, it's more that there's, there's back up to undertake the work, so uh, Veolia can bring over staff from either the, the Mile Point, the Wellington, or the Hutt plants to, to look after if we've got staff um, away sick or on annual leave. So it just adds a bit more um, redundancy in that system. They can, but do they? Um, yes, we do, regular basis. So we have staff go across both to backfill when someone's on leave or sick, but also provide assistance when there's larger jobs or an extra pair of hands required on site. One further question. Uh, on page 22, midway down the page, uh, the three stages of the alarm process. Each appears to be ended with an acknowledgement. Is there nothing to say that the actual acknowledgement turns into a completed? So we have different colours of our alarms. So the first one is red, which means the alarm is active. We then have acknowledged, which I think is yellow from memory, but still active. And then we have acknowledged and rectified. So the colours on the screen of our alarm system tell us that as well. So we can acknowledge something that's still going on. So for instance, again, with current alarms, whilst we're repairing something, we might acknowledge it, but the expectation is that our staff would be fixing it, and that's not that's acknowledged so they can rectify it rather than anything else. So, so the expectation is that they would complete it, but there is no sign-off? Well, the sign-off becomes, when it's complete, uh, it goes back to the normal status as well. Councillor Leggett. Um, so I've got a couple of questions. I, I mean, I just sit here and wonder whether you understand how difficult it is for us to sit here month after month and get the same stuff that comes from you around why projects are delayed. Now, I know there are operational issues in terms of project delay, and I'd like to see some more emphasis on the three projects that are in here that are underway at the moment particularly, you know, the aeration plant, which is we already seen on the screen from our friends from the Bay. How do, I mean, I, when I was chair of this back in 2019, we were talking about that, the aeration project, I mean, the UV project, sorry. Um, and these other two projects, I'd like to see some more, um, some more direct reporting on those as well in terms of how, how we're going. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's a kick in the guts for all of us, for all of people in Porirua, for, I'm actually embarrassed to sit around here and think that, and I, I'm, I'm saying this at an organisation level, I'm not talking to individuals, um, it's, it's embarrassing for us to have this happen when we were told originally that Veolia was get the best thing since sliced bread and um, I see that the bread is now stale. Well, that's your that's your um, delivery so far, and it's it's frankly it's not good enough for us for the people of Poirua. It's just not good enough. I don't want to be sitting around here next month to see there's been another failure of the UV plant. Granted, it's a polishing process, and we can get into discussions about how what, what actual impact it has on on water. But you know the fact is it's there and it needs to operate properly, and we need to know the money that's in our budgets to be spent on the plant is going to be spent and is going to be spent well. 
So that I mean, I, I, that's a bit of a rant, I know, but it's you've got to understand that this is real for us. It's really real, and it and it is embarrassing. So um, can I just uh, uh, I not want to make any comments about the um, about your report, the Veolia report around the incident. I would have thought that. To me, I would like to see if it came to us, and maybe it should be on the front end, what the correct... You know, there's a whole lot of detail about why it happened and all the rest of it. It's all looking back. What are the corrective actions up front so that we know that the likelihood of it happening again is... is it's never zero, but as close to zero as it, as it can be. Because those things are important for us as councillors sitting around the table looking at having to go through all this stuff. I don't understand, and can somebody explain to me the the E. coli results and what, what did it actually, as a result of this, somebody explain to me in words of two syllables, maybe three you can have, um, what all these results mean in terms of actual risk, right? I, I mean, I'm... I'm uh, yeah, I'll let you start there. Can somebody tell me that? I'll do my best. So the risk from um, E. coli is, is around uh, public health. So obviously one of the, yeah, well, the, the purpose of the UV disinfection in the first place is no, no, I to understand kill all, the I thing. understand all that. And so what we do, um, there are a number of, of samples that are taken. So we have a resource consent uh, compliance requirement to take one sample a day uh, at the UV. It has to be a grab sample because of the time it takes and, and the way that the, the samples are, um, are done by the laboratory. And then we also, if we have a bypass discharge, so if we've screened the wastewater but it bypasses the, the biological part of the process, we also take what we call as shoreline monitoring samples, and that's to try and determine what any, if any, impact there is um, from those discharges at the beach. What we did was we made um, the call that we were, by having the UV off, we were, in essence, bypassing the UV system. So we took it as a bypass discharge, so we started the shoreline monitoring to see if there was any Im impact. One of the difficulties we have is that, as um, the Our Bay Our Say ladies talked about in their presentation, some of those locations can then be contaminated from other sources. So if there's a, a discharge from a stormwater drain or a cross connection, then we can get high results. So what we do is we tend to look at it not as an instantaneous result, which is what you will have received in the report, but as a trend. Is that considered normal given the other things that are underway? Under a normal bypass discharge, this would happen in wet weather. You often get much higher results on the beaches um, during a wet weather event because obviously you get all the road runoff going down the, the stormwater drains and, and everything that's likely to come with that. Um, and so what we looked at was the impact. Obviously, you would expect there to be a greater impact by the outfall location. So we have the sample locations either side of the, the outfall. Um, they both came in uh, from memory within bathing beach guidelines, which are the guidelines that, that the regional council set. So, so based on that and previous results, we, we indicated that there was um, negligible um, impact on public health from the discharge with the UV off. So that, that. would... Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying, and I, and I understand the, the difficulty of sampling and what's run off onto the beach and what comes from the um, treatment plant. So, uh, but uh, are you saying here to us that even with the bypass there is negligible impact on what happens in the bay. That's correct, yes. Right. I, I, I hear you with that. So, um, and can I, so can I ask another question? With 
these incidents, um, what's the likelihood of them impacting our resource consent process or the outcome of our resource consent? I'll leave that to Mr Gardner to answer. Uh, through the chair. Um, kia ora tato. They're, they're not great um, for uh, seeking reconsent. Uh, they, they, show, uh, they show a history of non-compliance um, and they'll be taken into consideration by the commissioners when that consent is heard. Uh, sorry. No. So... So does that... Can I continue? So... It'll be taken into account. I'm not sure what that means. If they don't grant us consent, we're not going to stop putting sewer, treating it and putting it into the outfall. No, that's correct, but it might impact the conditions uh, that we're required to undertake the plant in accordance with. Such, so they, such they, as? Uh, well, they, they could be more strict with their reporting requirements, more strict with their monitoring uh, requirements than otherwise would be necessary, uh, more strict with... yeah. So those kinds of um, parameters. Okay, so I, I'm, I just wonder in terms of, and I'm maybe I should take this offline, but I, I'll put it out here now. So what I'm, what I'm being told and what I've understood all along is that when we have, because it's a polishing process, I mean, it, it, it's different when we get um, an overflow from the plant um, and, you know, you have a bypass of the plant itself, but with the, um, with the UV treatment, it has, if, if there is an overflow, there is a negligible effect on potential health outcomes um, in the bay. The potential health outcomes come from other sources, um, more localised. Is that true? So that's correct, yes. Um, and one of the pieces of work that we did um, in putting together the application is is around the um, dispersion and dilution modelling. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions. First of all, I just want to know, can you tell me what the cost of this consent process is, roughly? Oh. Yeah, Mr Chair, um, to date, uh, Wellington Water Advice, they've spent $1.7 million. It never ceases to astound me, you know, just a bit of how much it costs to, to go through this process, as as we will with the landfill. Um, look, David, or, or Mr Dow, while you're here, um, these ladies come along to, regularly to our meetings and tell us all the issues that we have in Titahi Bay. We don't appear to have the issues in any or many other parts. Um, what is happening about South Beach Road? Is, is the money that we're putting aside going to fix that problem? MacArthur's Park, that, but that, that piece of equipment there that hasn't been checked since 1980. Um, is just where are we? We're spending all this money, but these ladies come along every time and tell us we've got to, it's not just the treatment station, it's the rest of the issues that we've got there. Are we going to fix these ever? Yeah, Mr Chair, um, so firstly, with regards to the um, piping station down there, I will raise that directly with Wellington Water and find out what the maintenance regime has been. Um, secondly, with regards to the, the sub-catchment there, um, councillors, we don't have an update specifically on the roving crew, but they've now inspected around 60 properties um, in that area. They have found a number of um, faults on those properties. There's still a few weeks' work left before all of that um, testing is um, completed. And uh, I think at uh, sub-stage around um, by the end of June, we'd be able to have a better understanding of um, his reference to um, uh, Mr Hewitt Hewitt's um, reporting on, you know, where the problem might be. Um, the advantage of the, the roving crew exercises rather than starting at the bottom and working our way up. We're actually checking the very ends to begin with. So we'll get some information out of that um, and before the crew moves on to a, a different catchment. Um, if it is helpful, I'm uh, happy to commit to provide the next committee with a summary of overall of where the roving crew investigation and that catchment has gotten to uh, because by 
as I say, the end of June, we'll have a pretty good um, summary to give. And that should indicate whereabouts in the network the problems are, be they private or public, uh, because the crew has found um, at least one um, public issue in the network. Um, and just uh, give an indication of when repairs might take place. Well, I hope it's sooner than later because I'm, I, like uh, Councillor Leggett, I'm extremely frustrated about the whole Titahi Bay situation and uh, you, and it is embarrassing for us. We have to sit here, we're councillors, we're responsible for it and we're the ones who get it in the neck because it's our fault. Um, and, you know, we've, we're committing heaps of money to, well, we think we are, um, and with huge uh, rate increases and hopefully to fix the problem. So, um, yes, we would like a report, and, and my suggestion is you don't leave Titahi Bay till you've done the whole catchment, the whole area, before you move elsewhere. Because like everybody here, I'm tired of sitting here week after week and, and listening to the gripes of, uh, well, not week after week, but the gripes uh, of genuine, which are genuine, about the surf club, you know, that unit there to get fixed. I mean, how long does it take for someone to go and fix something? That that's obviously a problem. You know, just, just, uh, oh, you know, words fail me sometimes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I won't get on uh, a rant either. I think you've had enough of that already today. I do want to ask a question about uh, so called emergent contaminants. My understanding is that the plant, as part of its measuring, is recording information about so called emergent contaminants, such as uh, pharmaceuticals and such that are. Uh, you know, not normally a, uh, uh, a a significant amount of the contaminants that are coming through the wastewater treatment plant, but can I get some understanding, is that work being done? And if so, why would it not be available to us as um, members of this committee to see that kind of information, if it's peaking or increasing, or trend, certainly in the trend? No current sampling or testing is being undertaken on emerging contaminants. All right, follow-up question. Do you think that it may be prudent that, them, that uh, um, the plant may want to commence um, uh, identification as part of its sampling uh, around emergent contaminants? I'm not sure um, the areas... In, in regards to the other wastewater treatment plants in Wellington, none of them have sampling and testing done for emerging contaminants. Through the Chair, my understanding is that the Greater Wellington's regulatory scientists are in touch with our project team around how we can account for emerging contaminants coming uh, through, the, through the plant. So it may not be that it's a regular uh, monitoring regime, but it will be accounted for in some way. Uh, I'll go back and to catch up with the team and report back to this committee with uh, more details, if that's helpful. Thank you. OK, being no further questions, on, uh, I'll put that uh, paper of recommendations. All those in favour? Uh, against? Carried. OK, we now have the financial report 6.2. Um, and councillors, just be aware that on page 42, uh, where it says for the period ending 31st of March, it is the 30th of April that the period is for. OK, so I'll uh, move the pa move the recommendation. Councillor uh, Dunklin seconded, uh, open for discussion. Any questions? Councillor Hayward. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, I want to come back to a point that was raised by uh, Councillor Leggett. I think it's point eight in regards to the, the documentation about there being a delay in the uh, installation of the uh, UV uh, units and that uh, I've now received a verbal briefing that the work on that is now likely to be completed by November 2021. I am immensely frustrated that simple and straightforward information like that is not written down in the reports. You'd have to, f you'd have to hunt for stuff like that. The single paragraph that sits, what, less than 
what, 30 words that explains what is actually quite an important point that you've heard from two other councillors already about the degree of investment that's been tried to be made into the plant, and yet at the same time, not a lot of detail reporting on uh, the work that's been done, any risks that are coming up that may, that may, could, uh, that may uh, complicate the completion of these CapEx projects. I would like to, and Mr Chair, it may be something for, you, for, for us to take offline, but I would like to hope that we could have better reporting around the projects and around the risk assessment. From our end, we need to be, uh, uh, be satisfied on behalf of the people of Porirua that the work is being carried out and that any delays seem reasonable in context. This ain't good enough. Kia ora. I think uh, I'm not sure that that comes under the financial report. Rather, it should be in the previous report. But uh, however, your point's taken. Councillor Leggett, did you want to say something? Um, can I just ask the unfavourable variance um, related to increase in the ETS charges, David? Um, I, I, I read further on that there's an extra five dollars. It wasn't. Added. Is that the extra five dollars? That eight hundred thousand. It's a combination of the extra five dollars um, plus an increase. The, the problem with the ETS charge is that it's imposed upon us retrospectively, um, and so the uh, payment we've only just committed to the EPA as of a couple of days ago is for the last calendar year. So there is the five dollars which we lumped on earlier this year, but some increase from last year as well. Can I, uh, Mr. Chair? So, uh, David, can you? Bring us up to speed in terms of what projects do we have planned to actually reduce our emissions from the tip? So, I, um, yeah, sorry, you, you go first. Yep, so um, probably the most, uh, the, the most direct impact we can make on our ETS is by reducing the organic waste going in. So um, Potida City Council um, had a... Uh, a has had a briefing from officers on the possibility of um, a project to divert um, construction and demolition waste um, prior to going into the landfill, followed by a second stage of um, organic waste as well. It, it may be that it's a few years down the track, but that's probably the biggest hit we can make in terms of the actual generation of gas. The other um, possibility that we are pursuing at the moment, um, which will be through the EPA itself, is we still have the legacy of the old cell one producing gas. Um, and to some extent, um, we need to speak, well, we need to speak to the EPA about whether it's fair for us to be imposed with um, an ETS charge on that old closed cell or whether there are options around that. Right. Um, can I just ask uh, one more question? So I, I understood, and this is Wellington Water, back a while ago that um, there was a, going to be a, um, a sludge trial as it were, in terms of, um, and I think it was, it was with Wellington City, in terms of um, treating sludge to reduce um, um, contributions to emissions. Is that is that still going on? And... Yeah, we, we, we have a well in the city council project at Moore Point yep. um, to sludge, sludge minimisation. Yeah, yep. that, that, that's, that project is still in progress. We've, we've got a concept design and um, we've currently got a business case in progress that's nearly finished going to well in the city um, around about, I think, end of, end of June. So, um, so so we're likely to, I mean, if, if that could possibly be applied to Portirua, then um, that will come later, yeah? Well, the... the, the the, the, propo the, the proposed um, solution is is um, an upgrade at Moa Point. So you, you know, yeah, I, yeah, I understand, yeah, but yeah. but but the whatever you're going to do, yeah. and how the and the and the the business case itself, how it turns out, yeah. um, if it's if it's positive, then um, we could apply it to Porirua as well. Yeah, and we're certainly happy to share you know the business case once it's finalised. Right, with, 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 with yourself, that's no problem. Okay, yeah. that's great. Thanks. I would. Just a quick follow-up on that previous question. The Moore Point um, 
uh, improvement that's relevant to the last line of questioning. When is it likely to be up online and at what point will uh, there be data that can actually ascertain the, the, um, the outcome of that trial? Yeah, so so it's not a trial; it's actually a project to 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 build some kit to to reach you know to to mi to minimise the sludge that goes to the landfill in you know in in Wellington City. So, um, and as I said, I I, I don't know the exact set date, but it's sometime towards the end of June it'll be going public because it's it's going to it's going to Wellington City Council. So, um, obviously, there's a process of you know. A signing off on a business plan, yeah. but the business plan will have in itself details about when the project is due to be uh, operational. Can you can you disclose that? That that is highly dependent on funding decisions um, that need to be made by Wellington City Council. Okay, I was going to say something facetious then, but I won't. <laughs> um, no, I'm going, to, I'm, going to take, I'm going to take a comment on this. Yeah. Again, the, the nature of the responses that, that we get sometimes around here tend to but, lead me towards obfuscation or at least a lack of transparency. And that, again, only fields my, my increasing concern about the suitability of reporting back here. Uh, Councillor <laughs> Hayward, it, that's a Wellington City issue. It's not an issue here. It's a Wellington City Council that have instigated it, and that, so it's their situation. I mean, if it proves to be successful, then that information would be shared, and eventually we would have to then work out if we could afford to do it here. Or that, should we do it here? And that's fine. I'm not, to, not disputing any part of that. What I'm disputing is that the individuals, when they give us responses, seem to tend towards, we can't tell you much. It would be just be just busy to say, we just can't tell you that much. Okay. So can, can I just add something there? So it's a, it's a three-year program to implement it, but the decision has been made. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have a good discussion offline if you want, but, but the decision has been made about when it's going to, when it's going to start. Does that make sense? It's a fair Yes, so, apologies. Okay. And just to add to that, to be fair to Wellington Water, this has been discussed some time ago at the Wellington Water Committee, and there are a number of papers from Wellington Water around which talks about this particular project. So, you know, I understand, and I understand your points as well. Right. Okay, I'm going to put the recommendation in all those in favour, aye, against, carried. Now 6.3, the Spicer Landfall Joint Committee report. I'll move the recommendation to get it on the table. Councillor Hayward has seconded it. Um, open for discussion, questions? Anybody? Councillor Duncan. Yeah, um, on page 48, item 22, uh, Tonkin Taylor. Um, the company's uh, commencing its work in May 2021. Have they commenced? Uh, yes, we, well, sorry, we are to sit down to spec out um, how we're actually going to construct the, the contract program with them within the next couple of weeks. So they are confirmed on board and about to get underway. Okay, I still want to express my dismay or concern that a $3 million process to get an extra cell to, is just a complete and utter, uh, it astounds me, and it's the rate power that ends up paying for the bureaucracy. I know it's not their fault, but I'm just saying that the process, I'm just making the point as the chair that the process, it falls back, that the, our rate payers pay for it, and $3 million seems a hell of a lot of money. Do answer. That's my rent. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, being no further questions on that one, I'll put the recommendation in. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Now to 6.4, Spicer landfall uh, fee increase. I'll move the recommendation to get it on the table. Councillor Duncan, thank you. Mr D David. Sure. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, so we sought the committee's approval to put our charges up um, from 1 February this year on the back of uh, an increase in the cost of a carbon credit, which impacts on our ETS charge. Um, at the time, I advised the committee that we were likely to come to you for a further increase on 1 July in response to um, the government's confirmed increasing of the waste levy, which is now confirmed is going to happen for the next four years. And as it happens, we've now had a couple of auctions at carbon credit purchase, 
and it would seem as though it would be prudent to also allow for an additional $5 per unit again in ETS. So therefore we've done a bit of calculation here on what the actual um, impact is in terms of the charge and put this um, report forward looking for your support for an 11.57% 11 11 increase across the board. Councillor Hayward first, Councillor Leggett second. Uh, two parts, sorry. Um, the first one is, uh, has there been, uh, was there any consideration of using this as an opportunity to, uh, that we that we know that there is going to be a staggered increase uh, in the waste minimisation levy, why we wouldn't use a motion to actually uh, foreshadow and put in place those increases uh, through the time so that we could have just dealt with that all in one go as opposed to doing this year by year by, or meeting by meeting? That's what you yeah, Mr. Chair, the, um, uh, the, the, I understand the, the um, approach there. The issue that I would have in, in principle is that we would therefore be charging um, the customer for something which has not occurred yet, even though we know it's going to occur in 12 months' time. We'd be putting a levy on something that is not going to occur for a year's time. Um, and the principle, therefore, was, would be, do we take it to the $40 per tonne next year or the $50 per tonne the year after that. Uh, so in line with um, all of our other corporate charges that we um, make a, an inflationary adjustment to or whatever it is each year, this one will come to you, um, but it will be a little higher than the others. Thank you. The second question is, has any work been done on perhaps assessing what the uh, cost uh, is going to be uh, just solely in meeting our emissions trading scheme and waste minimisation levy commitments compared to the cost of any subsequent um, improvements to our collection scheme that's not pertaining to the wastewater treatment, uh, sorry, to the, um, to the uh, uh, landfill. Uh, I'm talking about, as you mentioned before, CND, and organic waste collection, because it's an eye-watering increase. And obviously, there's got to be an inflection point where the cost of this is uh, doing something better is better than the cost of what we just about approved. Um, your two comments on that. Um, the first comment is, yes, we are um, working on the um, balance of the economics between just simply putting the charges up versus do we inject some capital or take on partners, uh, whether they be regional partners or private partners, to provide something that is actually an alternative um, where the overall um, yield, if you like, is not that we're simply paying money to pay less ETS, but actually saving genuine money um, over the ETS. So... That um, that study is then um, our looking into the next two, three, four, five years of construction of facility to enable um, our customers to be able to take their waste somewhere other than up to the tip face. Um, the second comment I would make is that the possibly the intention, but certainly the outcome of the government increasingly putting these particular these two components up in price. Um, the outcome will be that whether it's us or whether it's private business, it will eventually be an awful lot cheaper to do something else with the waste than simply take it to the, the tip face, um, which is uh, aspirationally what we're looking for anyway. Um, but in the meantime, um, as you imply, councillor, um, it is still cheap to take it to the tip face, and so therefore there's got to be a, a bit of a balance. So just summary, Mr Chair, yes, we are looking into what the alternatives would be um, that would eventually be viable, um, but also industry itself will eventually be forced into looking at um, something else. Councillor Leggett. Yeah, my question was going to be along the same lines, and it, it's, uh, you know, it helps me, it encourages me to hear your response, although I'm not sure it's going to happen quickly enough. Um, what worries me with this is that, you know, immediate reaction is, bang, put up the price, and here we are, you know, at 11% um, plus price increase. And has there been any work done on what possible impact that will have on things like dumping? 
Um, we have those issues already, and people, you know, I can just see when people get, I mean, I, I hear it from people now, oh yeah, I took my trailer to the tip and it cost this much, and now it's going to cost a heck of a lot more. So has there been any work done on that? Um, what I have done is spoken to the um, parks manager who's responsible for our operations team that is the team that does the clean-up and made sure that the parks manager is well aware um, that he can expect uh, perhaps a few months of an increase in, in, in dumping. The very difficult part about it in talking to him is we can't simply swallow these substantial costs. So um, the best we can do is make sure the ops team knows they're going to be going out to a few more calls. Sorry, yeah, I understand we, it's difficult to swallow the costs and we don't want to as councillors because all it does is put pressure on rates, more pressure on rates. But, you know, it's a matter of how quickly that crossover point will be when it makes sense to invest in these sorts of projects so that people have alternatives and it's cheaper to take it to a, you know, a station that, that does something with it, green waste or whatever, and um, instead of taking it to the tip. That sort of infrastructure will cost quite a bit of money. Absolutely. Councillor Duncan. Yeah, um, knowing what we do about um, how efficient our recycling system is at the moment and how much of that recycling is ending up in the landfill because of contamination, how does that add to the cost for Porora City Council uh, for tonnages? Yes, yeah, so um, the... The current state of the recycling contract is that, uh, as I've mentioned to councillors before, um, we don't recycle one day a week, um, and what we do instead is we pay for that to be landfilled. There is a serious behavioural issue there. Um, councillors may be aware that Christchurch City Council has precisely the same issue, and a number of other councils do as well. Um, the, uh, the tackle there um, is, is through good marketing, good education, and um, trying to, to bring about a, a behavioural change. Okay, so you're clear it's option two that we are putting uh, is the recommendation that we increase. You don't need me to read it out. One more point then, just one. Sorry, just one. Um, so are we happy with the cost comparisons between ourselves and the hut in terms of the different pricing structures that appear to be there already and will continue to be there? My understanding is theirs is about to go up. No, well, <laughs> that's so it. Still, I'm talking about relativities here, yeah. not, not whether it's going to go up or not. I'm talking about relativities because I'm assuming the relativities will remain the same. Yes, relatively, um, we we compare um, well in, in price to the other two landfills at the moment. Um, we can make a guesstimate that they are going to also put their prices up, but in terms of direct comparison, we do need to be a little bit diligent that we're not seen to be trying to compete or, or otherwise. Um, but I've um, popped in a table there um, to show what our relative prices are for the time being, um, and probably, I would say, by the next committee, be able to update that with a new round of charges so you can see how we compare. Okay, all right, I'm going to put the recommendation, option two, all those in favour, against, carried. Thank you, that brings us to the end of the meeting. Thank you guys for fronting, and ladies, um, for fronting, and uh, I'm sorry that it's been a bit rugged, but uh, you know we put up with this every day, so we're just passing that on. So um, I hope you've got a clear message. <laughs> clear the meeting.